Today we're going to be taking a look at how the i7-4770K compares to the i7-4790K. Now these processors are so similar that they share the same family name but were released in separate years. Now both processors were built on Intel's 22 nanometer Haswell architecture and I've recently done a lot of testing with the i7-4790K and found it still had pretty decent gaming performance. So I'd expect the 4770K to have similar gaming performance but come in at a much cheaper cost on the used market. Currently looking at eBay, the 4770K can be found for about $125 compared to the $150 that the 4790K is averaging. So that's enough about these processors. Let's talk about the test bench and then jump into the results. Both processors were tested on an MSI Z970S crate motherboard. I used a Cryrig H7 air cooler. I used 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance DDR3 2400 megahertz memory, a GTX 980 Ti, and all of that was powered by a 1000 watt EVGA gold power supply. So plenty of power. Now the stock performance of these processors was tested using 1600 megahertz memory speeds. I chose that speed to reflect a more common DDR3 memory kit that you can find on the used market. It's really hard to find DDR3 2400 megahertz memory today, but all of the overclocking results were using the rated 2400 megahertz memory speeds to see the max overclocking performance we can get out of these processors. Now, I was able to achieve 4.2 gigahertz all core on the 4770K until temps hit 90 degrees when stress testing. And I was able to achieve 4.7 gigahertz all core on the 4790K. Again, that's when I reached uh, about 90 degrees when stress testing, so I stopped there. If you wanna see how to overclock and how I was able to achieve 4.7 gigahertz on the 4790K, I'm gonna link, link a video I recently did down below, and I might also put a card in somewhere. I haven't done that yet, so we'll see if it works. Uh, but it's a more long format how to overclock video. I personally hate it when people cut content out of uh, a learning video that I might find important. So this video is pretty much uncut and just fast forwarded through some of the more boring parts that I didn't talk. So go ahead and check that out if you're interested. But that's pretty much all of the information on the test bench. So let's take a look at the results. All games were tested at 1080p with their lowest graphical settings chosen. I'm switching my G uh, CPU testing to this method, so my GTX 980 Ti graphics card is no longer going to be the bottleneck in any of these games, and you can see how much FPS each game can theoretically render if you had a much more powerful GPU than the GTX 980 Ti that I have. All games were under 85% GPU usage, uh, with most being much less than that, which told me none of these games should be GPU limited. I had also tested at 720p just to make sure there was no GPU bottleneck at all, and in all the games tested, the frame rates at 720p were within margin of error of the 1080p results, so I, I have omitted them from today's graphs. Let's get started. As always, CSGO is the first game we're taking a look at, and here both processors are pushing well over 240 FPS at stock settings, so for competitive gaming on a 240Hz monitor, both will do fantastic for that. The 1% lows are a GPU limited section of the benchmark where the camera flies through a smoke grenade, but it's well over 60 FPS, so you'll be fine in that instance. If we look at the 4770K, the 4.2 all-core overclock is doing wonders to almost match the 4.7 GHz all-core overclock of the 4790K. That will be a little bit of foreshadowing in the 4770K's overall performance going forward in today's video. Battlefield 1 is the newest Battlefield that I own. They told me not to buy Battlefield 5, so I didn't. And here, we see a title with one of the larger gaps between the two processors. At stock performance, there's about a 10% difference. And even with an overclock, the gap doesn't close that much. But if you are looking to play at over 144 FPS, the overclock will do nice for the 4770K to achieve that. Even the 1% lows here are good. 100 FPS is about the threshold where most people can't tell a difference past that anyway. Devil May Cry 5 is a beautiful game that runs really well on most hardware. And here, both processors are a spitting image of each other. Stock and overclock performance is pretty much identical. But both processors reach pretty decent frame rates, and when overclocked, pretty much all these processors have a minimum of 100 FPS, so that's pretty nice. Gears 5 is another well-optimized title with tons of graphical settings. 
but playing at the lowest graphical, graphical settings nets us about a 13% difference in FPS at the stock settings for the 4770K and 4790K. While overclocked, we see pretty similar performance differences, uh, but it is another great showing for the 4770K, reaching pretty decent frame rates. Neither were able to hit 144 FPS though, so for competitive multiplayer and gears, you might want to look at a better processor. Recently, Fortnite had an update that submerged most of the map underwater, but luckily it didn't tank performance. At 1080p, both processors are spitting over 144 FPS, and when overclocked, both can achieve over 240 FPS, enabling competitive gameplay on a 240Hz monitor. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, or PUBG, is a new addition to the benchmarks. It's a popular title, so I figured I'd include it. Now, this game doesn't have a map selection when playing the normal Battle Royale mode, so I'm benchmarking in the training rounds. This is still an online area with other players in it, but not as many as the actual normal Battle Royale matches. I tested a couple normal Battle Royale matches against the FPS I got in the training grounds and found it was pretty even. The training grounds actually had worse overall performance most of the time compared to normal Battle Royale matches, unless you were in the bigger cities, which kind of evens out the performance differences between the two. Now, looking at these two processors, the 4770K at stock is struggling a little bit. Definitely over 60, F, 60 FPS, but compared to the others, it's a little slower. This is the largest disparity in all the games tested at a 16% difference. But when overclocked, they become identical in performance, and both are over 144 FPS at that point, so I'd consider it a draw. The last battle royale game we're going to take a look at is Warzone. And again, at stock performance, we see a 12% difference here. But when overclocked, that difference pretty much disappears. We are seeing barely over 100 FPS in this title, so if you do want to play Warzone a little bit more competitively, I'd suggest getting a newer platform with a better CPU. Possibly a Ryzen 3 3100 or 3300X. I wanted to include a racing game, so Project Cars 2 is up next, and here we see very good numbers. Looking at the results, I personally couldn't tell the difference between the two if I was doing a blind taste test uh, and couldn't crown a winner here. Both are great and they get very close to a competitive 240Hz gameplay, although I don't really know if that matters in racing games. Either way, both will run Project Cars 2 flawlessly. Siege is another popular competitive game I wanted to include in today's roundup, and here we are testing in the scenarios game mode. Even on low, this game looks really good. And the frame rates also aren't too shabby. Both achieve over 144 FPS at stock on average, and when overclocked, it creeps towards 200 FPS. So a fantastic showing uh, for both of these processors. Competitive gameplay is a breeze for these processors when overclocked, keeping that 1% low above 144 FPS, which is nice. The last game we're gonna test here is The Witcher 3. While it's an older title, it's still pretty demanding and still a pleasure to look at. So at 1080p low, both processors achieve a very similar level of performance when stock or overclocked. Now it's not a competitive game, but it still plays better at over 100 FPS, and both of these processors, when overclocked, can keep their 1% lows pretty close to 100 FPS at around 90. This game does like more threads though, so if you want to purchase a 6-core processor, you should achieve over 100 FPS at all times. And the last test here is Cinebench, a real-world workload. Here I've included the 2600K so that you can see the performance difference between the 4770K and processors that came before it. I did want to include the 2600K results in all the games I tested as well, but due to time constraints I wasn't able to. Here we see a 22% performance increase going from the 2600K to the 4770K. The odd thing is though, when overclocked, the 4770K only matches the stock performance of the 4790K which we know isn't really how the game results ended up showing. It was much more of an even battle. But this is a different type of workload than gaming. Either way, let's look at the percent differences to determine which one is actually a better buy. Now, when looking at the stock performance of both of these processors, it looks like there's a decent noticeable difference between the two, 
with a 10% on average FPS difference going all the way up to a 21% difference looking at CSGO. But what you need to take into account is that both of these processors can be overclocked. And what's the point of purchasing an unlocked processor if you're not gonna push it to its limits and overclock it? That's where things get really interesting. Jumping over to overclocked charts, we see on average only a 3.5% difference between the two, with really only one outlier reaching 9% in Battlefield 1. The overclocked results are really what you should be looking at when thinking about purchasing either of these processors. For about a 20-25% to lower cost, you can purchase the 4770K and only get a 3.5% slower on average FPS in the games tested. That's a pretty decent deal. And I'd suggest buying the 4770K over the 4790K all day after doing these tests. It's a much better buy. But let's summarize everything before making an actual recommendation. So the 4770K is still a pretty decent processor when you compare it to other CPUs in the Intel family. The problem arises though when you compare it to the rest of the market. Now currently in June of 2020, we're still dealing with this human malware problem and a lot of prices for parts has arisen. So the 4770K on the used market may be a little bit tempting, but when prices fall to where they should be and they inevitably will, the 4770K is no longer a good buy at $125. For instance, AMD earlier this year released the Ryzen 3 3100 and 3300X. The 3100 is going for about $100 and the 3300X should be about $120 to $130. Both are four core eight thread processors that outperform the i7-7700K, which is a much newer i7 than the 4770K and 4790K that we took a look at here. These new Ryzen 3 3100 processors also outperform AMD's earlier Ryzen 5 6 core 12 thread processor in games today due to their increased single thread performance and reduced core to core latency improvements. So yeah, it's really tough to recommend the older i7s in this case because not only are they on a dead platform and the i7s that I'm testing now are the best you can get on that platform, but when you compare it to the, to the Ryzen 3 3100 and 3300X and the AM4 platform, the upgrade path there is way better. You can put up to a 16 core 32 thread processor in the same motherboard that you're running your four core eight thread Ryzen 3 3100, which is an insane upgrade. So unless you can snag a really good deal on an i7-4770K and an unlocked motherboard, which is really hard to find for a decent price, I'd rather suggest you go with a Ryzen 3 3100 and the AM4 platform. It's gonna serve you much better. It's faster in games today and the upgrade path is way better. So that's pretty much it for this video. After our 250 some benchmark runs, this video is finally done. Uh, and I threw out half of those too because I didn't even include the 720p results. Uh, but yeah, if you like the video, go ahead and hit like. If you like the channel and the content, Go ahead and hit subscribe, uh, hit the bell icon next to that to get notified when I release new videos. I am trying to go for a two week every Wednesday release schedule, although I definitely blew that this time, but I'm still gonna try to hold true to it. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you in the next one.